From the Pittsburgh Ledger, PL Media, and The Drop, this is a podcast exploring the accountability murders in Pittsburgh. I'm Julia Page, and we're asking, who is no one? Aaron overreacted, but he had his principles. Michael, he looked like he felt so guilty. The last few weeks have been quite eventful here in Western Pennsylvania. Before we dive in today, if you haven't heard our first episode, I recommend you start there. If you've already listened, then wow, thank you. We started this podcast because we were looking to provide reliable information and context to an increasingly complicated situation in Pittsburgh. And based on the reception of episode one, it sounds like many of you have been looking for that too. Top five on the news and true crime streaming charts. That's Teddy Barstow, Metro editor of the Pittsburgh Ledger. And his previously established Julia's paper boss. I guess now it's also pot boss. Hey, in this economy, I'll take the overtime. If we, if, do we have overtime? <laughs> in all seriousness, none of this is about me or Teddy or even the Ledger. This is about the facts, as we know them, of a socially charged situation and making sense of the events of the last several months. Although recent developments over the past several weeks are going to make that even more challenging. Since we've last talked, we've seen a flurry of no one related activity, with all of this unfolding basically in real time. Teddy and I, along with the PL Media team, agree that we need to keep our format flexible. But it's also important to document as much of this as it happens. There are too many unknowns for us to wait until this case is tied up with a bow if that ever even happens. It can be hard to decipher the signal from the noise. But we're committed to making sense of as much of this as we can. And if sense can be found, it will be in the connections. We have a big interview to bring you later in today's episode. An inside look at the Kern family, which we teased at the end of episode one. But before that, how about we do a recap? Makes sense to me. We're putting the photos on the big board, even if we don't know where the red string goes. Exactly. And as I have been instructed by JC, our PL media producer, that's what we're going to call this segment. The Big Board. To the Big Board! Three Rivers University held a memorial mass in honor of recently murdered football coach Nathan Cade. Coach Cade was found in an elevated parking structure shot four times in the chest. Ballistics on the shell casings left behind at the scene match with the initial Richard Rowe murders, as well as the gun used in last month's murder of Louis Capel, Michael Kern, and the attempt made on Pittsburgh Police Assistant Chief of Operation Ben Kern's life. Coach Cade's body was also found holding a note containing a single word, clarity. Authorities are not commenting on what the note might be in reference to. State Senator Noah Kemp, previously a target of both No One and Richard Rowe, then held a press conference using increasingly charged rhetoric. This is a nation founded on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If the law does not allow us to defend any of those, then it's the law that has to change, not us. And then there's No One himself, later spotted in the city at the same Penn Avenue parking structure where Coach Cade was gunned down. No one fled the scene on foot after allegedly striking an officer, leading police on a chase across the city. He remains at large. Today, we're going to take a slight step back from the current events, though. As I mentioned before, if sense is to be made of no one Richard Rowe, these accountability killings, it will ultimately lie in the connections. Most likely, the connections we're not even aware of yet. That said, we're going to start by talking about the strongest set of connections we have thus far, the connections of one Pittsburgh family. In the accountability murders, family might be the only connection we know for certain. The first man to use the pseudonym Richard Rowe, the first to murder under the banner of accountability, Aaron Kern. On paper, his profile might seem similar to other killers, white, male, a quiet man who kept to himself, someone whose crimes came as a great surprise to his family. Oh, my God. Why do we have to keep fucking doing this? So what do I call you? Aaron? Richard? Hey! Hey! What about scumbag? How about I call you that? They're just names. I don't care. What do these people do to you, scumbag? You could have done something. You're just as connected to them as I am. 
Why didn't you? <laughs> he really doesn't give a shit. Do you? Of course I do. You think I'm killing people for fun? I already confessed. How much more are this we gonna do? What about your family, Aaron? What are they gonna think about what you've done? You know my dad. Ask him. That's Aaron Kern. Or is better known, Richard Rowe. This is a snippet from Aaron's confession after SWAT raided the Kerry Blast furnaces and officers took Aaron into custody. In the interest of transparency, the prosecutor released the full interrogation after they played some of the tape in court as part of their ask for no bail for the alleged offender. Those other voices you heard are Detective August Singh and Detective Kate Harper, detectives in major crimes assigned to the case. Now, before we get into Aaron's remark at the end there, we should talk about the Richard Rowe name one more time. In our previous episode, Teddy explained where the Richard Rowe name comes from, an uncommon variation on John Doe, used when the true name of a person is unknown or is being intentionally concealed. But this name, as it turns out, has extra significance for Aaron. In 2008, Aaron was arrested for a minor in possession. He was 16. What's come out since is that Aaron was taken and imprinted before a patrol supervisor, realizing who his officers had arrested, personally changed Aaron's name in the arrest report and told the prosecutors they wouldn't be seeking charges. The name on the report? Richard Rowe. That means Aaron's fingerprints were on file under the name Richard Rowe. So when he was taken into custody at the blast furnaces initially... He came up in the system as Richard Rowe. Of course, it wasn't long before officers realized who he really was. And that's the illusion you hear Aaron make at the end of the recording. For anyone who doesn't know at this point, Aaron's father is Pittsburgh Police Assistant Chief of Operations Ben Kern. Or I should say former Assistant Chief of Operations. Ben actually retired this week after a long career marked by success and tragedy. Now, Teddy, you've crossed paths with Ben a few times in your career. Yeah, he was the subject of arguably my most important feature. But in 2003, when I was an investigative reporter for The Ledger, we received information that an undercover officer had prevented an act of domestic terrorism planned by the Weissmach Brotherhood, a white supremacist gang targeting area mosques. We touched on this in episode one, but that act cost Ben his cover, left him shot twice, and almost cost him his life. I covered the events for The Ledger, including a profile feature on Ben. That's how we met. In the early 2000s, Ben's undercover work separated him from his family, sometimes for months at a time. During that era, the Kern family was held together by Ben's wife, Naomi Molina Kern, or she held as much of it together as she could. Naomi had a lucrative career at Keeling, Williams, and Mandelbaum that she wasn't able to give up since... Well, let's just say that a city police detective working undercover, even with tons of OT, doesn't exactly pull down major bread. And as if being essentially a working single mom wasn't hard enough, after Ben was shot, he required bed rest during his convalescence. Shortly after Ben ended his physical therapy and the Kern family assumed some sense of normalcy, Naomi was diagnosed with a rare lupus-like disease. Doctors were never able to arrive at a clear diagnosis, and after a brutal two-year fight, she died in 2005. Ben threw himself further into work. It wasn't hard for him to rise higher through the police ranks politically. He was a hero cop. How much do you think your feature added to that? No, no, I mean, it shined a light publicly on what Ben had gone through, but he was already pretty damn respected in the department. As I mentioned last episode, he came to be known as someone you could trust, whose word and reputation were solid. The right kind of police was a term that got thrown around back then. Personally, though, Ben was a mess. His home life was taxed the further he rose, and he absolutely developed trust issues after the shooting. And then, losing Naomi... I feel comfortable saying that rising the ranks was, in some ways, his way of coping. The job was what he knew and loved, and his reputation is what defined him. So when everything else in your life suddenly feels so unstable, of course, on the family side, there were other repercussions. This was the same era that Aaron was arrested and booked as Richard Rowe. Yeah, that's also when Michael, Ben's other son, started having his issues. Like his father and brother, he too found different ways of coping and had a series of drug and alcohol-related arrests into adulthood. When Michael turned 18, a cop discovered him passed out on a bench in the Enright Parklet in East Liberty. During their encounter, the officer found a gram of heroin on Michael, who was charged with possession. Michael was in and out of the system. No jail time. No jail time. But like I said, well, 
I actually want to be careful how I say this. Every cop in the city knew what Ben had just gone through. There are other incidents on Michael's record, mostly truancy, a later disorderly conduct charge, and resisting. Michael left home after that and spent the next 10 years on and off the streets struggling with substance abuse. It was on those same streets this month where Michael met his tragic end, shot four times in the chest by the same copycat who has now allegedly killed Louis Capel and Coach Cade, made an attempt on Ben Kern's life, and who was also alleging to be the true Richard Rowe. And that's something that, as we talk about connections, we really want to look at here. Because so far, Richard Rowe, and by Richard Rowe, I'm referring to Aaron Kern right now, Richard Rowe's victims have been politicians, millionaires, men in power, all doxxed by no one. Even our current copycat started by finishing no one's list, killing Louis Capel, and claiming ownership over the mantle for what has seemed to be similar ideological reasons. So why target Ben Kern? And why kill Michael Kern, a homeless addict whose only connection to any of this is by blood? Some theories that people have floated online. Again, this current copycat killer alleges that he is the real Richard Rowe. So is this some kind of vendetta against Aaron for taking the credit? Is this killer connected to Aaron or even operating under Aaron's direction from prison? Cleaning up an inconvenient loose end? This seems unlikely, as Michael has been estranged from the family for years and, we must stress, was facing no criminal allegations. Is it a random attack, meant to obfuscate a bigger pattern, a misdirection? We don't know. But these are the type of questions we wanted to ask Ben Kern about. Ben, who was gracious enough to sit down with Teddy once again for an interview. I met up with Ben two days after he announced that he was stepping down from his role as deputy ops and retiring, which we're going to play for you now. All right, here we go. It's good to see you, Ben. I'm sorry it's not under better circumstances. Well, it's uh, definitely a strange time, but yeah, yeah. It's good to see you too, Teddy. I know a lot of others have been asking for you to sit down for an interview, and you've been declining. I appreciate you talking to me. Well, we, we have history. Well, first of all, how are you feeling? Next felt better. Grace wound or not, getting shot is definitely a young man's game. Well, this week you announced that you were retiring. Why now? Was it the shooting? Uh, that's part of it, sure. All the current events are. And Michael. It was time. Well, let's start at the beginning. The first no one data drops. Why do you think the district attorney didn't elect to pursue an investigation into those first four people named by no one? Well, you'll have to ask the DA's office. Maybe it was being pursued federally. Maybe they turned over their files and were cooperating. It's, it's not uncommon for the DA's office to kick high-profile cases over them. It's not my place to speculate. You gotta understand, the Bureau of Police has limits, jurisdictional, ethical, and constitutional limits to what a police department can do. But do you think there was a moral imperative to at least vet the information to see if credible cases could be made? Mm. With the benefit of hindsight, yes, I do. Well, how would you describe your initial reaction to the allegations that Aaron is facing? Allegations I should point out that he has confessed to. Uh, Aaron's always had a lot going on in his head, but he's never been the type. Does it feel like it came out of nowhere? I remember once, must have been a holiday or something, because I was home. This was during the undercover year, so that was a, a bit more rare. Anyway, I was in the kitchen and I heard this big crash, furniture scattering, yelling in the living room. Right over there. There was Aaron and Michael having a huge fight. They were young, still nine, ten years old. Michael was always the stronger one and he had Aaron pinned against the wall, but Aaron wasn't giving up. I separated them and everyone was yelling and I was too. And I wanted to know what the hell the problem was. Well, they've been playing a game, maybe something out for Christmas, and Aaron claimed Michael had cheated. Michael denied it to his face, and so Aaron absolutely destroyed the game. 
and then tried beating the hell out of Michael, which, you know, didn't exactly work since Aaron was the one that ended up pinned against the wall. Michael denied cheating up and down, but Aaron was adamant. He kept saying Michael had to be punished. Maybe he thought he was doing the right thing, attacking Michael. Instead of coming to you, in a sense, he took the law into his own hands. Look, it's a hard lesson as a parent. No matter how hard you try, how much you're there for them, there's no formula raising a kid. You can't make someone into the version you want, right? They're human beings. And at some point, they're going to be and become who they are. The best you can do is try to teach them to love themselves and respect others. Do you feel like you did that? Naomi did it better than me, but yeah, at least I thought I did. So how did you find out how far prosecutors say Aaron went? I am, well, I, I was assistant chief of operations, one rung under the chief, high enough to oversee daily operations, but I wasn't the face of the department on the Roe case. The chief of investigations handles major crimes. I knew the broad strokes, but it wasn't under my purview. I wasn't there when they apprehended Aaron. I had no fucking idea until they brought him in. It was... Anyway, the department acted quickly to manage the release of the information to the public. You mean not revealing Aaron's identity to the public? Right. Why obfuscate his identity with a Richard Rose pseudonym? Well, technically we didn't. Aaron was in the system as Richard Rowe. Okay, but come on, Ben. People in the department figured out who he was within the first two days. I have confirmation on that. You all sat on this for weeks. Yeah, it was, it was a bad look. Your decision? No. But I understood it. Public trust with the police is low. You follow the news. It made sense. Richard Rowe made it easier for everyone to rally around. It didn't impact our ability to enforce the law and ensure justice. And this copycat who now uses the name Richard Rowe, do you feel any responsibility? Yes. Why? Because he was influenced by my son. We hear a lot of different theories out there, and there's a common one that Aaron wasn't just Richard Rowe, he was also no one. No. How would that even be possible? No one saved me while Aaron was in custody. That's, that's verifiable. That brings up the obvious question. Why do you think you were a target? And Michael? You're really asking this. On the surface, it doesn't track. Why do you suppose... My son was murdered. I don't know, Teddy. Ben, I'm just trying to make sense of why him or why you... Maybe this copycat has a wild hair up his ass for my family. I don't know. And do you think this is a copycat? What do you mean? Well, he's claiming to be the original. He's not. Aaron confessed. I'm a cop, so maybe it comes with the territory. Aaron did what he did. So maybe this new person decided to target me. But Michael... He did not deserve this. I'm sorry, Teddy. Uh, can we, uh, can we, uh, sorry, can we stop here? I don't, I don't think. It's just harder than I thought it would be. Being here, home. The boys, Naomi, it's just, it uh, feels wrong. And why did you retire? That is a good question. Wow. All the sacrifices that Ben Kern made in his life personally and professionally culminate in this. Thanks for doing this, Teddy. Actually, there's one more piece to play here. 
After our sit-down, Ben and I talked for a while longer, reminisced about some old times, and there was this one moment in the conversation where we drifted back to Aaron and Michael. I asked him if I could turn the recorder back on. So after I grounded Aaron, Michael came up to me, tears in his eyes, contrite. It turned out he was cheating. Aaron overreacted, but he had his principles. And Michael, he <laughs> he looked like he felt so guilty, and I don't know what to say. So I told him, forget it. It was just a game, and his brother had to get used to an unfair world. Maybe I shouldn't have said that, but Naomi was always better at this stuff. A son in jail for murder. Another son and a wife dead. And Ben Kern, who would be alone if it wasn't for his connections to a web of mysteries and murders. Is Ben Kern the victim of tragic circumstance, or is he in some way part of its creation? The actions of the Kern family have had their own ripple effect on the city. We've got a state senator promising to enact bold criminal justice reforms and citizens that are taking personal accountability to another level. There's no formula. No single person makes another. But that doesn't mean people won't emulate behavior. Is that where we leave it? I think so. Join us next episode as we, I'm sure, recap whatever new events transpire here while we also take a deep dive on the case against Aaron Kern. For the Pittsburgh Ledger and The Drop, this is Who Is No One. I'm Julia Page, and he is Teddy Barstow. If you haven't already, please remember to subscribe to the show on your podcast app of choice. We'll see you soon. To read more about No One, head to blackmarket.la. Who is No One is produced in partnership with Black Market Narrative and ZQ Entertainment. Black Market Narrative.